wait a minute. Don't take it that way. Hey, hey. Wait. Wait, wait. There's so much we can teach you. We've improved the lives of savages all over the world. Savages? Not what I meant. Let me explain. I... Let go. No, I'm not letting you leave. Indigenous women and girls across the nation are intensely vulnerable to violence. So much so that murder is the third leading cause of death in Native women. In Native communities, we all have someone. An aunt, mother, sister, or daughter. We all have a relative affected by this. And I wear red today in remembrance of our stolen sisters. Native girls are critically affected by lack of visibility by the dominant culture and lack of action to protect them. If you are American Indian or Alaskan Native, which I will refer to as Native or Indigenous, or if you come from a community like mine, the following will not be new information. For the rest, please look around you and find five women. Consider them a represented sample of these Native communities, and then think of them as your very own immediate or extended wonderfully imperfect family. I see your families as wise, beautiful, diverse, broken, and brave. Now, consider this. According to the National Congress of American Indians, as Native women, they will experience higher rates of violence, experience violence more commonly at the hands of non-Native perpetrators, and as victims of violence, be less likely to receive needed services. Specifically, the data tells us what no one wants to hear. Of the five, four will have experienced violence within their lifetimes, and they are 1.7 times more likely than a white woman to have experienced violence in the past year. More than half will have experienced sexual violence within their lifetimes, and they will face murder rates more than 10 times the national average in some counties. The Urban Indian Health Institute, based in Seattle, brings our stories to the light of day. Their 2018 report, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, describes how missing and murdered Indigenous women disappear through the cracks not once, but three times, in life, in media, and in data. Of their 506 unique cases identified across 71 urban cities in the United States, more than half of the cases were murder cases. 135 cases included victims aged 18 or under. 42 cases were related to domestic violence, and 29 is the median age of victims, with the youngest victim being an infant less than one year old, and the oldest victim being an elder of 83. I grew up watching community members disappear. It was only a few years ago when I discovered that this is happening across the country. The absence of Native American representation in Congress contributes to the erasure of indigenous women. Some legal practices are in place. The Special Domestic Violence Criminal Jurisdiction allows for the prosecution of non-Native offenders by tribal associations if the crime included domestic violence, dating violence, or criminal violation of protection orders. This may bring relief to some, but the law does not cover sexual assault, stalking, or sex trafficking. This means that Native American women who live in urban areas and experience sexual assault are not protected by these amendments. A suspect cannot be convicted unless the victim is Native, the offense occurred on tribal lands, and if the tribe can provide a defendant and diverse jury for the trial. 71% of Native people live in urban settings. Who is protecting them? In January 2019, Deb Haaland from New Mexico was elected as one of the first Native American women to serve in Congress. Her work as a co-sponsor on the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2019 means that indigenous women will not be left unprotected, forgotten, or invisible. You have heard about the multitude of women who make up this epidemic. The long-lasting effect, though, is felt by Native children. When mothers, Grandmothers and female caretakers vanish, children are left without the adults they need in their lives. This issue compounds in communities with high rates of single mother households, like the Pascua Yaqui Reservation in Arizona, where 43% of households account for single mothers. Add the intersection of LGBTQ, low income, or children with disabilities, and you can quickly see how the disadvantages are stacked against them. This issue is impacting families who already have difficult lives. In the words of LaDonna Bull Allard, we are a people of trauma. To acknowledge a Native child is to empower them. To acknowledge Native youth is to stop erasing them. My story illustrates how Native children can fall through the cracks. 
I first experienced racism in elementary school when I was teased for wearing my moccasins. The older I got, the more I was mocked for representing my culture and my heritage. I then only embraced my cultural practices on the reservation and I tried to blend in when I was at school. I entered ninth grade as most 14-year-olds do. I was insecure, passive, and looking for direction. I was uncomfortable with my sexual orientation and my place in social settings. I was sexually harassed by upperclassmen who evidently faced no consequences for photographing, catcalling, pinching, and grabbing young girls like me. Without help, I found it increasingly difficult to find any joy in my life. I began to misuse antidepressants and fall behind in school. At 14 years old, I decided that my life was no longer worth living. I attempted to take my own life on February 9th, 2016. In the 1964 Olympics, Native American Billy Mills shocked the world and came from behind in, to win the gold medal in the 10K race. Since then, he has dedicated his life to serving American Indian communities. He once said, your life is a gift from the Creator. Your gift back to the Creator is what you do with your life. It was not always easy to view my life as a gift. Sometimes it felt impossible. I was fortunate enough to survive my attempt and I spent my 15th birthday celebrating my partial recovery with family. I then enrolled at Muckleshoot Tribal School. At tribal school, running became part of my recovery. Running empowered me and made me feel valuable. When I ran at Muckleshoot, I ran to represent my community. When I arrived at track meets in a tribal school uniform, I was perceived by rivaling schools as a joke. Despite my qualifying times, I would be excluded from larger invitational meets due to my school size. I had been asked if I even owned a uniform. During a home sporting event, a rival school had put graffiti in our bathroom. Offensive slurs, such as Indian Savage, were plastered on the stalls. It became apparent to me that I can't protect Muckleshoot Tribal School youth from the racism and prejudice of others. I can, however, prove these biases wrong through example. The best way I could do so was through running. Training on my own could be isolating and discouraging, but I wasn't working for just myself. The more work I put into practice, the better I performed at meets, and therefore, the better I could represent my community and challenge the prejudice I faced from bigger schools. Through running, I could demand acknowledgement. It empowered me and saved my life. Even when I began to slip through the cracks, my running would find me and bring me back. Because of running, I now attend college at Iowa Central Community College in Fort Dodge, Iowa. I did not always know how to use my voice, and running gave me a powerful nonverbal platform. Jordan Marie Daniel from the Lakota tribe ran in the 2019 Boston Marathon with a red handprint as a way to use her running platform to raise awareness for the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic. When I saw the photo of Jordan in her uniform, I felt powerful. I felt like I wasn't alone anymore. I found her contact information and I asked her permission to follow in her footsteps and to raise awareness for my stolen relatives at my state track meet. She was beyond enthusiastic and supported me like a mentor. She's since then guided me. At the time, I was running track and field at Muckleshoot Tribal High School. I qualified for state championships and I dedicated each of my races to a missing or murdered indigenous woman in my community. I asked permission from the families and then created a photo with a poster board and their stories and put it by the race results so that spectators would need to see that my relatives are real, that this epidemic is real, and it's happening across the country. I painted a red handprint over my mouth as a way to represent the indigenous women that have been silenced through violence, along with the letters MMIW down my right leg. After I received each medal, I brought it to the poster display where I gifted it to one of the women I was representing. I won the 1600 for my aunt, Alice Looney, who went missing in 2004 from Wapato and was found deceased 15 months later. The police had no answers for my family. I won the 800 from Jack, for Jackie Salyers from the Puyallup tribe who was pregnant at the time of her death. Tacoma police shot her as they were attempting to arrest her boyfriend. She was a mother of four. The officer was never held accountable after being cleared by a review board of his own peers. I won the 3200 for Renee Davis, a member of my Muckleshoot community. Renee and her unborn son, Mossy Molina, were shot and killed by Auburn police during a welfare check with her other two children present. 
I dedicated my sportsmanship medal to Masi. I placed second in the 400 for Misty Upham, a member of the Blackfeet Nation and a successful actress who was invited to the Golden Globes for her performance in Frozen River. Misty was found deceased in a bottom of a ravine by my reservation after Auburn police did not look for her and then mislabeled her death as a suicide. Acknowledgement is power. Native youth across the nation have the ability to use individualized platforms to share their messages and their stories. Indigenous women and girls across the nation are intensely vulnerable. Their self-image is distorted, and in the worst cases, they are no longer here. They are our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, and our aunts. As I improved after my suicide attempt, I found a greater and new appreciation for life. Running for missing and murdered indigenous women made me feel like I was finally doing something bigger than myself. Some of us are more visible than others. Indigenous women need the larger communities to hold the legislator accountable to combat this epidemic. Allies can use their power and visibility to advocate for change. Each of us have a platform. Mine is running, and through platforms such as athletics, art, and music, we have the ability to speak for those who have been silenced. And I am ready to hear from you. Thank you.